In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Now jump over with me to Acts 2.14. Then Peter stood up with the eleven and raised his voice and he addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Peter goes on to quote some verses from Joel. Look with me in uh, verse 22 of Acts 2. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you with miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of lawless men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Look at verse 32. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact, exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Verse 36. Therefore, let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I like verse 40. It's one of my favorite verses. Peter was a preacher after my own heart. It turns out it says, with many other words, he pleaded and warned them to save themselves. And then Acts 2.41 says that 3,000 people became believers that day. Come on, let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help us. Come, Holy Spirit. Come any way you want to. Come, Holy Spirit. Do whatever you want to do. Come, Holy Spirit. Say whatever you want to say. Confront whatever you want to confront. Come, Holy Spirit. Change whatever you want to change. Father, breathe life among us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. In this day and age, what do you suppose is the best way to share the gospel? What's the best way to share your Christian faith with the people in your life? What's the best way to tell others out there about Jesus to make a big impact in our culture with the gospel? Is the best way to be over the top? To be bold, direct, to be confrontational, controversial. Over the top has certainly worked for Lady Gaga. And it worked for Madonna before her and Elton John before her. Over the top is the strategy of social revolutionists. 10% of the population can overtake any society if they're over the top. Thank you, Karl Marx. So is the best way for us to share the gospel to turn up the heat and turn up the volume? Or is it better to be understated? Is it better to be a good example and hope that people will draw the right conclusions about salvation on their own? You know, lately in the evangelical world, a lot of evangelism strategies have gravitated towards quiet demonstrations of Christian love. Feeding the hungry. Clothing the naked, giving water to the thirsty, doctoring the sick, serving in love without speaking. It's like St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel at all times and if absolutely necessary, use words. To be sure, doing all of these good deeds is the natural overflow of God's love having been poured into our heart by the Holy Spirit. Jesus said so. But I wonder if quiet demonstrations of Christian love are enough as a strategy for evangelism. A lot of American evangels, evangelicals have been told that the way to share the gospel is to just quietly embrace everybody. 
and to avoid offending people, to avoid pushing them away or alienating them by speaking truth directly into their lives. God loves you just the way you are. You know, it's true. God does love you just the way you are. But he also loves you way too much to let you stay the way that you are. In fact, Jesus died on the cross so that you don't have to stay the way that you are. He gave his life so that you could trade in your empty way of life for his more abundant life. It's a very good thing that Jesus was never on Facebook. Imagine all the ugly comments that Jesus would have gotten when he confronted the woman at the well and he told her, go call your husband knowing full well that she was living with a man and that she had had five failed marriages before that. That wasn't very loving, Jesus, to call her out like that. You know, actually, Jesus spoke directly into people's lives all the time. He told the rich young ruler, you lack one thing. He told Nicodemus, you're Israel's teacher, yet you're spiritually ignorant. You need to be born again, Nicodemus. After he lifted up the woman caught in adultery, he told her, go and sin no more. Jesus lifted her up, but he didn't just lift her up, he cleaned her up. Beloved, secular society has convinced too many Christians that to make clear, direct statements of biblical truth is judgmental and unloving. Don't you buy it? Jesus said that to speak God's eternal truth is to love. So what's the best way then? Is it better to be over the top? Is it better to be understated? Maybe a happy medium, a little bit of both, sometimes one, sometimes the other. Well, maybe instead of asking what's the best way to preach the gospel today, we should back up a little bit and we should ask, is there a right way to share the gospel? You know, according to the Bible. There's a better approach than asking what do I think will work today? Or, or even what seems to be working today? Our question needs to be, what has God promised in his word will work? We're on a journey of discovery together in the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit is calling his church to awake. I want to tell you, we are living in the last of the last days. The signs of Jesus' return are all around us. The harvest is the end of the age. And all over the world, the Spirit is moving. Jesus wants us to awaken to His call on our lives. He wants us to awaken to the fire of God. And He wants us to awaken to the apostolic gospel. As I look at the believers in Acts chapter 2, I find three acts of apostolic witnesses, and I want to share them with you quickly today. And of course, by quickly, I mean with many other words, he pleaded with them and warned them. Three acts of apostolic witnesses. The first one is this. Apostolic witnesses do the same works as Jesus and even more. Apostolic witnesses do the same works as Jesus and even more. Beloved, the opening line of the book of Acts gives us the best definition ever of the gospel. In my former book, the gospel of Luke, I wrote about all that Jesus began doing and teaching. Beloved, the gospel is doing and teaching. The gospel is not works without words. Neither is the gospel words without works. The gospel is both works and words. And it's important that we're absolutely clear. The works that we're talking about specifically is the supernatural ministry of Jesus. Beloved, I want you to know there's a hole in our gospel. And it's not a failure to engage in ministries of Christian compassion. The whole in our gospel is a failure to engage in the supernatural works of Jesus. Namely, prophesying, laying hands on the sick and seeing them recover, and delivering those who are oppressed by demons. The evangelistic strategy of Jesus and the early church after him was not social action. 
but to engage in supernatural ministry followed by an explanation in teaching and preaching. Jesus sent out the 12 and he said, go into the towns and the villages, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, drive out demons, and then preach this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near to you. You know, I continue receiving testimonies about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that began on Mother's Day. Had a membership class on Thursday evening. Our third one this year had 30 new members in our membership class on Thursday night. We had a, a couple that shared a, a testimony that I, I didn't know. The wife had been coming here to harvest time for a while and couldn't get her husband to agree to come. And finally, you know, she kind of used Mother's Day to turn the screw a little bit. And, and he came on Mother's Day. On Mother's Day, he came as a present to her. He was in the first service when the Holy Spirit fell down on me and then started falling down on all the other people. And when he saw it, he said to his wife, I want that. I didn't know it, but he received Jesus as his Savior that morning, and he's been with us ever since. See, that's the way it works. Supernatural signs and wonders open people's hearts to receive Jesus. Beloved, listen to me. I want you to look at me. May God give you grace. May God make a deposit of his Holy Spirit in your heart today through the Word of God. Listen, God has called every one of us every one of us to share the gospel by doing the supernatural works of Jesus. You don't believe that, but the Holy Spirit's going to convince you. Prophecy is not just for pastors. Deliverance ministry is not just for deacons. Healing is not just for a handful of chosen few. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, whoever believes in me. I looked it up in Greek. You know what it means? Whoever Whoever believes in me, the same works that I have done, he shall do, and even greater than these. People have struggled with those words of Jesus in John 14. Greater works than these? How could that be? Jesus walked on water. Jesus calmed storms. He raised the dead. What could possibly be greater than that? But you know, the very first supernatural work in the book of Acts was 120 believers from Galilee speaking in 15 human languages that they had never learned. Jesus never did that. Jesus never healed anybody with his shadow. Jesus never supernaturally escaped from prison. Jesus never ran alongside a chariot. Jesus never survived a poisonous snake bite. But the believers in Acts did. And his promise of greater works is still good for us today. The title, The Acts of the Apostles, was given to this book by the church fathers in about the third century, and it's not quite a perfect fit. One reason is that the apostles fade off the scene very quickly in the book of Acts. Only Peter and John are mentioned after chapter 1. And then only Peter after chapter 4. And then none of them are mentioned after chapter 8. Or 12, excuse me. But the, the larger part of Acts is the story of what God did through ordinary believers that were full of the Holy Spirit and on fire. Stephen and Philip were ordinary believers. When persecution intensified, ordinary believers spread the gospel everywhere while the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. An ordinary believer laid his hands on the eyes of Saul and something like scales fell off of his eyes. James, the half-brother of Jesus, an ordinary believer, not one of the original twelve, became the pastor of the church at Jerusalem and he led the Jerusalem council with a word of wisdom in Acts chapter 15. Barnabas, Silas, Apollos, Priscilla, and Aquila, they were all just ordinary believers on fire. Do you know the ultimate example in Acts of an ordinary believer on fire is Paul. In Acts 1, Luke very intentionally records the account of the choosing of Matthias to replace Judas in the circle of the original 12 
to make the point to us that Paul was not one of those in that original circle of 12 apostles. In Acts, Paul is not one of the 12. He is an ordinary believer on fire. Maybe this book should be called The Acts of the Unapostles. Maybe it should be called The Acts of Ordinary Believers on Fire. The message is not that the apostles were unimportant. The message is that you are not unimportant. The Holy Spirit wants you to become a witness to the gospel by performing the supernatural works of Jesus. That's good right there. Come on, you got to help me. I preached four times already, and I'm preaching for the Spanish church this afternoon, so you better pull me through, all right? Let's go. As you think about your own attempts to share Jesus with others, I wonder if there is a hole in your gospel. Maybe you've tried sharing words. I know some wives who want their husbands to come to Jesus, and they've shared lots of words, lots and lots of words. Maybe you've tried the route of doing good deeds and, and showing quiet Christian love and compassion. But have you tried the supernatural ministry of Jesus? I have a friend that pastors here in Greenwich, and a while back ago, he shared his testimony with me. He was a brilliant young man studying at an Ivy League college, and there was a, an older spirit-filled believer who had a campus ministry and one day he and that older spirit-filled man were sitting at a table together and the older gentleman was trying to share Jesus with him. But my friend was resistant and he was argumentative. He, he was agitated. He was confused, he said. He, he couldn't understand. He couldn't grasp what the older gentleman was trying to tell him about Jesus. Finally, that older spirit-filled believer stopped and he said, you know, he said, would you let me, could I just pray for you? And he stood up and he put his hands on my friend's head. My friend said when he did, he felt something move inside of his head. It was so startling, he looked up and he said, how did you do that? And instantly, that haze of confusion and that agitation and all that argumentativeness just left him instantly. He was able to understand what the man was telling him about Jesus. He asked Christ in with his heart right there at the table, and he got filled with the Holy Spirit at the same moment. You've been trying to share Jesus with somebody. Maybe there's something standing in the way and Jesus wants you to lay your hands on their head and with the help of the Holy Spirit, take that thing away so that they can open their heart to Christ. Apostolic witnesses do the same works as Jesus and even more. I want to tell you something. It's a lot more fun to be used in a miracle than to watch a miracle. The Bible says that the children of Israel saw God's mighty deeds, but Moses understood his ways. Children of Israel were witnesses to miracles, but Moses was a worker of miracle. And I want to tell you, I've been both. I have both witnessed miracles and I've both seen to God's glory and honor and grace. I've seen him do some wonderful things through the laying on of our hands. I want to tell you, it's a lot more fun to be a worker of miracles than a witness of miracles. And beloved, that's what God wants you to be. Mm, that's from the Holy Spirit. That wasn't even in my notes. <laughs> Apostolic witnesses, three acts. The second act is this. Apostolic witnesses stand up with a big H on their chests. Apostolic witnesses stand up with a big H on their chests. Peter stood up and he spoke. Last week I told a story about my friend Michael Morris. This week it's his wife Debbie's turn. So I have to tell you my friend Debbie Morris is one of the funniest human beings that I've ever known in my life. And in the 16 years we've been friends, she has introduced me to a plethora of funny sayings. I can't repeat a lot of them. <laughs> Not because they're off color, just because they're too mean. But it, when, when, someone, when someone is just being a crybaby, when someone's just feeling sorry for themselves and moping around and mourning, Debbie's saying is, put a big H on your chest and handle it. I have no idea what that means. But I, I think it means something along the lines of, put on the right attitude and deal with it. 
Beloved, I want to tell you, sharing the gospel absolutely requires that we stand up in our culture. I want to tell you, I am so proud of our teenage students doing See You at the Pole this Tuesday. You need to pray for our kids on Tuesday morning. What a, what a courageous... What a courageous thing to stand up in the flagpole in front of your high school and let everybody you know know that you're a follower of Jesus. You know what? I'm so proud of Pastor Kevin. In the last couple of weeks, he has been on the telephone with and met with every principal or vice principal from every high school represented in this youth group. And he's getting permission to go into the schools and go eat lunch with the students just so that he can tell them about Jesus. I'm proud of you, Pastor Kevin. Well done. Sharing the gospel absolutely requires that we stand up boldly, but we have to do it in the right attitude. I hate to contradict dear St. Francis of Assisi, but it is always necessary to preach the gospel with words. Good deeds and acts of Christian compassion are not enough on their own. They must be accompanied with a message about Jesus. Even the supernatural ministry of Jesus is not enough to lead people to the right conclusions on their own. I want you to notice with me that it was not the sign of the tongues that moved people to become followers of Jesus. It was Peter's message that day. We're not called to be silent witnesses. Listen, culture is trying to tell you, shut up. Don't let them tell you. We are not called to be silent witnesses. Peter said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because God has chosen the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. People will not look at our exemplary lives and make the connection to salvation all by themselves. They won't look and say, oh, look, what a nice guy he is. He's doing good things. Say, I should repent of my sins and give my heart to Jesus. They won't make that connection on their own. Good works and, and especially supernatural works uh, open their hearts, but to expose people's spiritual need requires that we stand up. But we have to do it with a big H on our chest. I'll explain. H stands for three things. First, we must stand up with the help of the Holy Spirit. When Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost, he didn't preach a sermon like I'm doing now. What he gave was a prophetic utterance. It says in Acts 2.14, Peter stood up and he uttered forth. Those words are the same words in Acts 2.4 when it says the 120 uttered forth in tongues. Peter was enabled by the Holy Spirit to speak the right words that connected the supernatural signs and wonders to their spiritual need. He was enabled by the Holy Spirit to speak the right words that confronted and convicted and convinced all at once. You know, that's just what Jesus did. Jesus had the ability to speak the truth in love so that in one divine moment, People were simultaneously convicted of their sin and convinced of God's love for them. That's what happened with the woman at the well. Jesus confronted her, but at that same moment that she was convicted of her sin, she was convinced more than ever of God's love for her, and she ran around saying, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. And the Holy Spirit helps us to do the same. So we must stand up with the help of the Holy Spirit. Second, we must stand up in a spirit of humility. We must stand up in a spirit of humility. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Peter spoke bold, confrontational words. You, with the help of lawless men, put him to death on the cross. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified to be Lord and Christ. But listen, beloved, Peter did not speak from the position of someone who was blameless. Rather, Peter spoke from the position of one whom had himself been forgiven. Peter delivered those bold words, knowing full well that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he had betrayed Jesus too. He delivered those words knowing that Jesus bore his sins on the cross just as much as anyone else's. That's why it says he warned them and he pleaded with them. 
Beloved, Jesus has called us to be his witnesses. We don't speak as judges of others, but we speak as ones who offer first-hand testimony to his saving goodness and grace. One of our missionaries said it this way, I'm just a poor beggar who found the way to the bread bakery. The world has characterized our stand for truth in culture as judgmental and unloving. But listen, to warn someone of imminent danger is not to assert that you're better than him. It simply means that because of your own experience, you're in a position to see better or know better. You know, nobody in his right mind would fail to speak up and warn someone that they were walking into imminent danger. And no person in his right mind would resent someone for doing that. Imagine if you were standing on a sidewalk and you saw someone crossing the street and you saw a barrel car, speeding car, just barreling towards him and you shouted, look out, there's a car coming. And imagine if the guy in the street turned and looked at you and said, hey, stop judging me, man. But you know, that's just what the world does. When we stand up, they shout back at us, stop judging me. And then a bunch of misguided believers agree, yeah, stop judging him. Beloved, I want to tell you, our country, listen to me, America is in imminent danger. Our culture is in imminent danger. We must stand up warning and pleading, but we have to do it in a spirit of humility. And when we do, you know, some will respond in humility. It says in Acts 2, they were cut to the heart. Literally, that word means that they were humbled in their heart. Humility calls forth humility in some. Stand up with three H's. The help of the Holy Spirit, humility. Third, we must handle criticism with sincere humor and honesty. We must handle criticism with sincere humor and honesty. When Peter stood up, he addressed both sincere questions and also sarcastic criticisms that had been thrown out there by the crowd. Some were amazed and they asked in sincerity, what does this mean? And others mocked saying, ah, those guys are drunk as skunks. It might get a little lost in translation, but there's a light note of humor in Peter's response to his critics. He says, hey guys, come on, we're not drunk. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning after all. His humor was sincere. It wasn't sarcastic or sardonic. It didn't return an insult for an insult. It neutralized the sting of their criticism. I take my kids to soccer practice in the afternoons and this week Ben's team was working on stopping the ball and taking control of it. And that's exactly what the Holy Spirit helped Peter to do. He helped him to stop the ball and take control of it with a light note of humor and he can help us to do the same. Apostolic witnesses stand up and speak with a big H on their chest. The help of the Holy Spirit, a spirit of humility and handling criticism with humor and with honesty. Three acts of apostolic witnesses. The last one is this. Apostolic witnesses speak the foolish content that saves men's souls. Apostolic witnesses speak the foolish content that saves men's souls. Beloved, the gospel is works and words. It is deeds and declaration. It is touching and teaching. It is demonstration and proclamation. Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost is, to me, the second most important sermon in the Bible. The first most important one is the Sermon on the Mount. This is the second because it gives the essential content of a gospel message. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ it is the power of God to everyone who believes, for God has ordained through the foolishness of what was being preached to save those who believe. I believe that when we share Christ with others, it's good for us to share our subjective experience. It's good for us to share what Jesus has done for us personally, but we need to do a little bit more than that. We need to share the objective truth about who Jesus is and what he has done on the earth. Very quickly, as I look at Peter's sermon, I find four elements 
of gospel content. And I'm going to give them to you fast. Four elements of gospel content. The first one is this, explanation. Explanation. Some people made fun of the 120, but others had serious questions. What does this mean? And Peter started out by offering a reasonable biblical explanation to their questions. This is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel. That this outpouring of the Holy Spirit is the signal, the beginning of the last days. Beloved, can I tell you that people have all kinds of sincere questions. What does this mean and what should I do? Can I tell you the Holy Spirit can give you the ability to answer their questions? The Holy Spirit, as you fill your heart, as you fill your mind, yourself with the Word of God, the Holy Spirit will help you to answer people's questions right there on the spot. Peter did not know what was going to happen on the morning of Pentecost. When he woke up that day, he had no idea what was coming. Peter did not know that he was going to have to offer an explanation from Scripture about the sound of a mighty rushing wind that was so loud it caused a crowd to come together from all over Jerusalem. I imagine that sound was like when you hear people interviewed after a tornado. They always say the same thing. They said when the tornado came, it sounded like a train was coming he didn't know that he was going to have to stand up and offer an explanation for that phenomenon he didn't know that he was going to have to stand up and offer an explanation for how 120 Galileans were speaking in over 15 different human languages that they had never learned with no accent but he was full of the word of God and the Holy Spirit helped him in that moment to take the scriptures he knew in Joel 2 and in three different Psalms and to offer people a reasonable biblical explanation for their questions. And the Holy Spirit can help us to do the same. Four elements of gospel content, explanation, and secondly, proclamation about Jesus. Beloved, tell people the story of Jesus. Tell them about his sinless life. Tell them about his miraculous works. Tell them about how Jesus of Nazareth went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Tell them that Jesus' miracles are God's evidence that this was no ordinary man. Tell people about Jesus' death on the cross. Tell them that the cross was God's plan of salvation for mankind before the foundations of the world were laid. Tell them that the Father delivered His own Son into the hands of wicked men. Tell them that Jesus offered His own life for the sins of the world. Jesus was in complete control throughout the entire passion. They would not have been able to arrest him. The cross could not have held him except that he laid down his life. Tell them that they crucified to death the author of life. Tell people about Jesus' resurrection and his exaltation. God delivered him up. Wicked man nailed him up. But then God raised him up. Tell them that God vindicated Jesus by raising him from the dead. The decision of a Roman court was overruled by heaven's supreme court. The ultimate symbol of Jewish humiliation, God has turned into the ultimate symbol of mankind's triumph. Tell them that the Gospels are eyewitness accounts of these events in history. Tell them that the activity of the Holy Spirit is evidence that Jesus is indeed raised to the right hand of the throne of God where he is reigning with his enemies under his feet. <laughs> Tell people the true identity of Jesus. Tell them it was impossible for death to hold on to him. He's not just a prophet. He's not just a moral philosopher. He's not just a man, a myth, or a legend. He is Lord and Christ, Israel's Messiah and the one and only Savior of the world. Jesus is Lord means that Jesus is Yahweh. Jesus is God. Everything that the Old Testament says about God is true of Jesus. Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. Let the church of Jesus Christ give him praise.
beloved acts of Christian compassion and even supernatural works are not enough on their own, we must tell people plainly about Jesus. Four elements of the gospel. Explanation, proclamation. Third, <gasps> confrontation. <laughs> even telling people the story of Jesus isn't enough for them to make a connection with their own spiritual need, they must be confronted. Peter told them directly, you did this, you need this. You sent Jesus to the cross, you need his salvation now. For everyone who's ever worked in sales, this is the most important moment of the transaction, the moment of decision. Confrontation is something that people in our culture don't have a stomach for, especially when it comes to the issue of human sinfulness. Even a lot of believers think that we should shy away from it. You know, when Denise and I were in seminary, we studied with a dear friend named Ron. Ron was an older student. He had inherited a very large farm from his dad, and he ran that farm for several years before he decided to answer the call to ministry and come to seminary. Ron was a single man, and he had a heart as big as all outdoors. He would do anything for anybody, and he did. But one day, another older student named Pat came to me with a problem. Pat's husband owned a massive ranch in Montana, tens of thousands of acres, and Pat was like a mama to all of us. And she came to me and she said, Glenn, she said, I noticed that Ron has a body odor problem. And she said, some other people have noticed it too, and they've said some things to me. She said, you're his brother. Would you go to Ron? And would you tell him so that he can make whatever changes he needs to make? And I said to her, yes, I'll do it. But I didn't want to do it at all. I was embarrassed. Why did I have to be the one to go tell Ron, you stink? I didn't want to see the expression on his face. Uh, I didn't want to experience that awkward moment when I broke the news to him. I didn't want him to resent me for confronting him. You know, the truth is I was only thinking about myself. I wasn't thinking about Ron at all. I was only thinking about preserving myself, not protecting my brother. Days went by, and every time I saw Mama Pat, she cornered me, and she said, Did you tell him yet? And I kept making excuses. Oh, I haven't seen him. I've been very busy. There's always been people around. Finally, Mama Pat went, and she told Ron herself, Ron, you stink. <laughs> and immediately, Ron took appropriate measures to stop stinking. We graduated from seminary together, and Ron went on to become a great pastor of a wonderful little church. The Lord blessed him with a beautiful, good, lovely wife. And I believe all those doors opened up for him because Mama Pat loved him enough to go say, Ron, you stink. <laughs> you know, Ron went home to be with the Lord a few years ago. His picture is on our refrigerator at home. He and his wife and Denise and I, the four of us together. And I love to look at that picture and think of Ron and what a great man he was. And it's also a very good reminder to me that love requires that we go confront people. And sometimes we have to tell them, you stink, you need Jesus. Four elements to gospel witness. The last one is this. Explanation, proclamation, confrontation, and finally, prescription. The apostolic gospel worked. The combination of the supernatural signs. Peter standing up full of the Holy Spirit. The spoken words of explanation, of proclamation, of confrontation. All of those things came together in one divine moment. And people were cut to the heart, literally humbled in their heart. And they asked Peter, what shall we do? And Peter gave them a prescription. Repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter told them directly, this is what you must do. When I was a kid, I sprained my right ankle kind of bad 
And on a few occasions throughout the years, I, I've re-injured it. The last time was a couple of years ago, and I went to see Dr. Rana, and he gave me a prescription. It was called RICE, rest, ice, compression, and elevation. And he said, if you follow the prescription, your ankle will get better. I did follow the prescription, and I got better. Beloved, I want to tell you, may God give you grace. Listen to me. Our job of sharing the gospel is not complete until we give people the prescription for salvation. This is what you must do. Repent, be baptized, and receive. Very quickly, that word repent, it means to have a change of mind. It means to have a change of heart that causes a change of direction. You were headed one day, uh, one way down life's road and somebody came to you with the word, with the good news about Jesus. You had a change of mind. You, you had a change of heart and it resulted in a change of direction. You did a 180 and now you're traveling completely the opposite way. Repentance involves a bit of remorse, sorrow for having lived in defiance to God, for having damaged yourself and damaged others. Don't have time to treat it fully, but the command to be baptized in the name of Jesus was a radical command to that Jewish audience. Peter's not giving a formula for baptism here. He's saying, be baptized upon your confession of Jesus Christ as Lord. Baptism means to make a total break, a radical break with your old way of life and to begin a totally new life as a follower of Jesus and not to make that a secret, but to announce that publicly and openly. To receive the gift of the Holy Spirit is to receive the living presence of God in your heart. That word receive means to accept something as a gift. My birthday just passed a couple of weeks ago and I got a few gifts. And when people handed me a gift, I didn't leave them hanging. I reached out and I received the gift and I didn't leave it wrapped up. I, I opened it up and I enjoyed it. Salvation is a gift that God offers freely, but we must reach out and we must take it. We must receive it from him. What's the best way to share the gospel in this day and age? It's to awaken to the apostolic gospel, doing and teaching, works and word, three acts of apostolic witnesses. They do the works of Jesus. They stand up with the help of the Holy Spirit and they speak the foolish content that saves men's souls. May we become his witnesses. Come on, I want to ask you to stand together with me. And I want to invite you to give Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, a great big praise in this place. Come on, I know you can do better than that. Come on, I know you can do better than that. Come on, let's lift up Jesus. I want to ask you to bow your heads all over this place with me. have to ask this question today from the Holy Spirit. I wonder if there's anyone here today and maybe you're like my friend Ron. Maybe you're a hard worker. Maybe you have a lot of goodwill towards people. You help anybody you can. You do anything for anybody you can. But there's a personal problem. You need to be washed. You need to be cleaned. You need a fresh change of clothes. Truth is, your empty way of life stinks. Truth is, there's things in your life that, that are not good. And you need to trade out your old life for Jesus' new life. wonder if you're here today, you've never invited Jesus Christ into your heart. What must I do to be saved? Repent. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Tell God you're sorry for your sins and invite Him to come in. I wonder if there's somebody here you've never prayed that prayer and today is your day. Listen, today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear God's voice calling you, don't resist Him, but open your heart completely to Jesus. I wonder if you're here today You've never prayed that prayer. 
And today is your day to do it. I want to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus in. While heads are bowed all over this place, come on, we had somebody last service who asked Jesus in. Who in this service would raise your hand while heads are bowed and just say, I want to pray that prayer and I want to invite Jesus in. Come on, if you want to receive Christ as your Savior today, let me see your hand lifted up high. Come on, are you here? Today is your day. Today is your day. Come on, you need to be cleaned. You need a fresh set of clothes, the robe of righteousness that Jesus gives. Come on, is there someone here today? I need to be cleaned. I need to receive Jesus. Is everybody here a believer? Everybody here, is everybody here, everybody here you know Jesus is in your heart. Is there someone today I want to receive Jesus? Let me see your, let me see your hand high if you want to invite him in. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, Holy Spirit's tugging on somebody's heart. If your heart's beating fast right now, that means it's you. It means the Lord wants you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We praise you, Father. We praise you, Lord Father. We praise you, Jesus. It's one more thing that I want to do today before we leave this place. When the Holy Spirit fell out on Mother's Day, there was a man in the service who saw it and said, I want that. And beloved, if you want the deposit of the Holy Spirit to do the supernatural signs, the supernatural ministries of Jesus, it's yours today. I believe that the Holy Spirit wants to make an impartation, a deposit, so that you can be a witness to the gospel by doing the works of Jesus. I believe that He wants to give you a deposit of the Spirit on your lips to prophesy. I believe He wants to give you a deposit of His Spirit on your hands to lay hands on the sick. Somebody in this room, you've been praying for someone you're close to who has cancer. God wants to give you a deposit of the Holy Spirit today in this place that the next time you go and see them and you put your hands on them and pray for them in the name of Jesus, cancer is going to be healed. God wants to give somebody a deposit today of the Holy Spirit so that when you speak to that family member or that person you've been working on, the cloud of demonic confusion is going to lift off of their mind and their heart is going to be open to receive Jesus. I believe the Holy Spirit wants to give you a gift this morning. And if you're here and you say, I want that, I want to invite you to come forward to the front. We don't have a blue line here like we did a few weeks ago, but I want you to pretend that there's a blue line here. I want you to come stand. I'm going to ask Pastor Faith, Pastor Kevin, uh, any of our pastors that are in the service at any of our prayer times, if you'd come, Philip, come help us minister. And I want you to come stand up. And I believe that God is going to make a deposit of His Holy Spirit in you that you can be his witness doing the supernatural ministry of Jesus. Come on. Come make a, make a straight line. Ushers, help us out if you would a little bit. Help folks to make a straight line. Um, those of you in the front, step a couple steps forward. Everybody would just line up together, shoulder to shoulder. Come on, I want you to lift up your hands and let's just begin to worship Jesus. We worship you, Lord Jesus. We worship you, Lord Jesus. We praise you, Lord Jesus. We honor you, Lord Jesus. Father, I ask today in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on your church, Lord. Father, I pray that you'd pour out fire, Lord, in our hearts, Lord. I pray, God, that the consuming fire of God would burn in our hearts to love like Jesus loves. I pray that the consuming fire of God would fall down on our lips, Lord, to speak the words of Jesus, Lord, to say what Jesus said. I pray that the fire of the Holy Spirit would fall down on our hands, Lord, to do what Jesus did. God, I pray you'd pour out your spirit on your servants, Lord. I pray that you'd give us great boldness. I pray that you'd stretch forth your hands Lord, to do mighty signs and wonders, Lord, in the name of your holy servant, Jesus. God, I pray you'd make a deposit of the Holy Spirit on us right now in Jesus' name. Come on, lift up your hands. Just begin to worship the Lord. We're going to come and lay hands on you and pray. Uh, our pastors and prayer teams just begin ministering. Come on, Pastor Nick, help us out. Thank you, Jesus.